Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. This podcast celebrates storytelling as essential. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, showcasing the talents of my author and narrator friends. I hope you'll hear an artist you love or find your next favorite wordsmith. You know, the, the more I researched it and I f- realized that Geraldo Rivera had done the expose on this school, um, which, you know, I didn't learn about in school and we should have. Yeah. So that got me really like, holy cow, how come I haven't heard of this place? And so the more research I did, the more I realized how dark and complex the place was. This is Ellen Marie Wiseman talking about discovering the place that became the location for her latest historical fiction, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook. To begin with, this isn't a historical fiction that's very far off or distant. This story takes place in the early 1970s on Staten Island at an infamous institution that maybe you've never heard of until now. We connect with Ellen as she's getting ready to travel to New York for the book's launch. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Can you hear me? Perfectly. So, the third voice in our chat is Dr. William Bronston. He's one of the real-life heroes in the history that caught Ellen's attention. She starts her book with quotes from him, about the conditions at Willowbrook. He was there. And his physician activism helped bring an end to the institution's almost unspeakable negligence and abuse of the weak and the different. You'll hear what he thinks about Ellen's storytelling in a minute. But first, let's hear from Ellen and find out why she was drawn to Willowbrook. Um, I didn't know about Willowbrook. I'm, I'm 61 years old. I didn't know about Willowbrook until a few years ago. And um, one of the things that I like to do in my fiction is uncover these things that we didn't learn about in school. You know, I was shocked when I did my research. And so many people I've talked to had not heard of Willowbrook. And it's just, you know, some older people, they say, yeah, I, I saw Geraldo's expose and stuff, but that's what everybody ties it back to. They don't know the real, real story. And Dr. Bronston obviously knows way more about it than I do. But, you know, it because it was like this underground city, here here you had this beautiful campus that looks like a college campus, but what was going on behind the walls, no one knew. And that made the whole situation worse because the staff was trapped there too with their hands tied because of underfunding and, and the you know, administration didn't trust the staff. Staff was afraid to rat on each other because they'd get beat up on the way to the parking lot. And, you know, it became such an underground city that, you know, from what I read that you can, they could buy and sell drugs and alcohol and jewelry and meat and, you know, just crazy. And you wonder, did the people in Staten Island, did the people in New York know how terrible it was? I don't think they did. You know, the parents were not allowed to go into the wards and see the conditions firsthand. So it was definitely undercover. You just said that things are not what they seem on the surface or they're hidden, right? And I think you have, you've used this in your storytelling so subtly and adeptly, like in the very first chapter, maybe the first two chapters, there's a moment where Sage is walking in the house and there's family pictures hanging on the wall. And she says something about, you know, it's just a moment in time. It's just a snapshot and it doesn't really show you the full picture. Um, And she, this echoes again when she first comes to Willowbrook and she talks about the woods and the facade of the building, but you, you give this foreboding sense of that. This idea of things are not what they seem is very powerful to me in this story. The storyteller for this, um, the voice that you chose, Sage is 16 
And we really hear her, her frailties, her insecurities, even the way you sort of have her second guessing herself Mm -hmm. in her mind really fits this story so well to me. Can you talk a little bit about how you found that voice, how you chose that character to tell this story through? I mean, I was a teenager in the 70s, so that helped. (laughs) But, you know, I really wanted to tell this story from someone that did not belong in the institution. Um, And I wanted to tell it from the inside instead of from the outside, someone on the outside looking in and trying to help. I wanted the reader to feel what it would feel like to be there and to be trapped there. Um, and so, you know, I, I really did want to bring out Sage's personality. You know, she's only 16. She's worried about her boyfriend. She's worried about her friends and, you know, just that normal 16 year old mindset. And then, you know, she thinks I'm going to go to Willowbrook and I'm going to find my sister because no one's going to help me. And, um, you know, she has no idea what she's getting to, into, obviously. All she knows about Willowbrook is the rumors surrounding it, you know, the parents telling kids that if they don't behave, they'll be sent to Willowbrook. And, um, you know, that girls are warned if they get pregnant when they're teenagers, that the babies will be deformed and end up in Willowbrook. So that's really all she knows about Willowbrook. So she goes in there not expecting what happens to her at all. Yes, I'm glad you brought up rumors because I feel like in the very beginning, this helps us set up of the energy of what of how you're writing about this. Rumors are a big part of that. And you the main one is this urban legend of Cropsey. Yes. A, a kidnapper, a rumored serial killer in this area. And this is before you even get to Will- Willowbrook. Mm-hmm. Um, you kind of set up the the societal conditions almost of this region. Um, you have her almost talking about it like a dumping ground, this area. You even have her say something about people being disposable. And so I felt like you, from that very beginning, you interwove these things. So which came first for you when you were writing this story? Well, I was actually first drawn to Willowbrook. I first found heard about it when I watched the documentary about Cropsey, which is about the supposed serial killer that you know, supposedly lived in the tunnels below the campus. And, you know, it's funny because I was talking to someone the other day, um, a member of the audience that was in one of my book events, and he said he was from Staten Island. And he said, you know, you really caught the way that people felt like Staten Island was the dumping ground for New- for Manhattan, you know, the, the mob dump bodies there. And, you know, they had the sanitariums there and, you know, the Fresh Kills landfill. And so, yeah, Willowbrook was kind of a, it was a dumping ground for, un, you know, kids that were disabled and, and mentally disabled or physically disabled. And there was some non-disabled kids that grew up there too, because, some parents just wanted to get rid of them or the foster care system couldn't take care of them. Um, I heard stories about kids, you know, found in public places with signs around their neck that said, take me to Willowbrook. So I, I did try to set that up a little bit. I don't know if I did it consciously, but I guess it worked. I thought that you interwove these plots beautifully. And, and I, I think that's so at the heart of this, right, is that the rumors and the surface and we never see truth or the depth of things. So it was one of my favorite parts of your storytelling. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Because she didn't realize what was packed away in her once she understood the reality of the situation and it just poured out from her gut. Yeah. Okay, did you catch that? Dr. Bronson chiming in with an observation about how Ellen works as a storyteller. Did you hear her affirm his words? Okay, so just listen to what he tapped into. Once you get it, once there's a breakthrough, you can't go back and see the picture the same old way. Mm -hmm. You can't be remote. You can't be alienated from the horror. All of a sudden, you own the horror and you have to address it. Well, you know, all of my books, like my very first book was um, based on my mother's experiences growing up in Germany during World War II. And, um, you know, I grew up visiting my family there because she came to America alone and I've been inside the bomb shelter where she hid. And 
I heard my grandmother talk about going out under the cover of night to leave food out for the Jewish prisoners. I heard the story about my grandfather being drafted and sent to a Russian POW camp and how he escaped and things like that. And then when I went to high school and we learned about it, everybody knew I was German, so they called me a Nazi. So I think that's kind of what started my whole uncovering these hidden stories that, you know, these social injustices and these hidden stories, you know, um, not many people know that at its peak, uh, the Nazi party at peak, only 10% of the Germans were, German population were members of the Nazi party, but they were all painted with the same brush. And so, you know, I've written about child labor. I've written about the Spanish flu. I've written about in um, how people were treated differently in circus sideshows and things like this. And so this whole, when, when I started to uncover Willowbrook, it was like, I, I like, like Dr. Bronston said, it just kind of like poured out, like, this is something that everybody needs to know about and needs to get upset about. What is it like for you, Dr. Bronson, to read Ellen's interpretation? You know, how are these descriptions, how has she captured for you uh, the sights, the smells, and the feelings that, that she's been able to evoke? You know, her uh, sensitivity to the situation is just astounding to me. And, and as I read the book, uh, I became more and more anxious and I couldn't get past the fourth chapter. It made me too anxious because I never experienced what she imagined. I mean, I was in there as a warrior and as a, as a physician, I never identified emotionally with the powerlessness and with the terror that she captures in the folks that are there. I mean, her handling of the story, it was so intimate that I, I really, I, I had to put the book down. I, mean, I had to come back to it later when I gathered my strength because I was just too anxious reading what was going on. And, and it was it like it, re, it resurrected the PTSD in me that I wasn't fully cognizant of. I mean, the sadness, the sadness of the place is unspeakable. And every time I revisit it, it, it brings me close to tears. The inhumanity was incredible. That's a good place to pause and listen to a few minutes of the audiobook right from chapter four. So you can hear what Dr. Bronston had such an emotional reaction to. The narrator, Morgan Hallett, is a New York City-based actress. She is an Audiophile Earphones Award winner and has lent her voice to over a hundred audiobooks. This is from The Lost Girls of Willowbrook, written by Ellen Marie Wiseman, narrated by Morgan Hallett. Sage wanted them to shut up. She needed them to shut up and listen to her. Couldn't they see she was terrified? Didn't they know she was falling apart? And what about the crying and moaning coming from out in the hall? Couldn't they hear it? Didn't they care? Nurse Vic winked at Dale. We're not as old as you think, honey. We'll see who teaches who. Leonard and Dale laughed, then pulled Sage toward the end of the counter. She looked over her shoulder at Nurse Vic as they dragged her away. Please, she cried. This isn't right. Nurse Vic sat back down and lit another cigarette. When they went around the counter and started down the hall, Sage stopped in her tracks. If the attendants hadn't been holding her up, she would have fallen to her knees. Young girls, ranging in age from children to gangly teenagers, lined each side of the hallway. They were crowded together by twos and threes in beds and chairs and wheelchairs. Some of the beds were more like carts, with large wheels and handles for pushing. And several of the wheelchairs were made of wood, with rusting wheels and thin armrests, as if they'd been pulled from a Victorian museum. Many of the wheelchairs had long wooden boxes in place of seats, 
like coffins without lids, in which girls lay crumpled on grimy sheets, their pale, thin limbs pulled into fetal positions, their wrists and hands curled up to their chests. Most of the girls were either wearing cloth diapers in various stages of undress or naked. All were thin, their spines like pale ridges, their shoulder blades sticking out like sharp wings. Bruises and scrapes covered their skin, and a few had what looked like cigarette burns. At first, Sage thought some of them were dead. Their features and limbs were so cadaverous. But then she realized they were sleeping, or unable or unwilling to move. Several tossed their heads around, blind eyes searching and searching, while others looked at Sage with haunted eyes, reflecting all the horror she felt. One girl's face was crusty and bleeding, as if it had exploded from the inside. Some were missing body parts, arms or legs or hands, while others had misshapen heads or deformed limbs or torsos. Dark splotches and brownish-yellow puddles speckled the tiled floor, and moans, honking cries, and gibberish filled the air, along with the stench of human waste. A black terror grew inside Sage's chest, choking her, closing her throat. The rumors were true. This was no school. It was a nightmare, a dumping ground for the broken and insane and unwanted. No wonder the people in charge never allowed parents in the ward. They would have called the police. Again, she asked herself how her mother could have left Rosemary in such a horrible place. Dale put his free hand to his nose. Sweet Jesus, he said. What is that smell? You'll get used to it, Leonard said, and yanked Sage forward. Undeterred by her resistance, he and Dale dragged her down the crowded hall, past a young girl inside a coffin-like box stained with something dark and sticky looking. The girl turned her head and looked up at them, her face full of pain, her eyes pleading for help. An older girl smiled at Sage, gleeful and happy, as if she had a hilarious secret that she was determined to keep to herself. Sage squeezed her eyes shut and tried to cover her ears, but Leonard and Dale kept tugging her arms down. Her heart hammered like a runaway train in her chest. This couldn't be real. It couldn't be. No one would do this to children. No one would treat them like this. Maybe she was dead. Maybe the bus had crashed on the way here and she had been killed. Maybe this was hell. Something going on right now that's really, really interesting, and I don't fully understand it. The success of her book uh, is linked to an extraordinary resurgence of awareness and concern by enormous amounts of the population. Something about the Willowbrook story is touching the nerve of the culture right now. Yes. I do think there's a hunger for connection and humane community. Yeah. I do think maybe it's coming through COVID, um, this desire to feel uh, like we celebrate what's different because not being different is boring and, and that we are hungry for connection and community and seeing one another in a different way. And I th also think it's, I also think it, it's resonating because Ellen is a really good storyteller. Oh. Um, and I, the one other thing, and it's, it's lighthearted really in some ways, but there's a scene that I wanted to ask you about Ellen. That's, it's maybe halfway through the book. We're in the ward with Sage. So that part's not lighthearted, but she covers her eyes and her ears and she pretends she's somewhere else. And then you make this very specific list of physical memories, an ice cream parlor, a banana seat bike, a darkened theater waiting for the movie to start, breathing in the smell of fresh popcorn. You rattle through this list of things that as the reader, it was very, in the same ways that you transport when things are dark 
and you bring to life smells and sights that are disturbing. You, you put her in her mind with this list. I wondered where some of those came from for you. Um, well, I think that it's, it really, people, you know, they tell you, you meditate and, and try to clear your mind. Or if you're going through a hard time, you know, picture yourself at the ocean, things like that. And so that's kind of what I tried to do. And, you know, of course, the banana seat bike and uh, going to the movies and um, being at the beach, that's all things that I remember from the 70s. Um, so and, and to show, too, that she is just human like the rest of us, you know, that she's I mean, I mean, obviously, we know she is, but, you know, she's not being treated that way. And it's a reminder that she is just you know, being her, her, seeing her trapped in that should scare the crap out of people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a story about identical twins. Mm -hmm. Um, Our main character who you tell the story through is searching for what happened to the other sister. So it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, even just this mistaken identity, even the way you've done this because she's an identical twin, it's that things are not what they seem at surface value, that when you look at something, it's not quite what it is. And she suffers from that because she's um, she's assumed to be someone else because she's an identical twin. Mm-hmm. I thought that that also made her feel very real. Um, was there inspiration for that? Did you Do you know twins? I, well, I do, I do know a couple sets of twins, but I think, you know, I had a sister at one point and, um, I think it was really important to, for the reader to understand the relationship and why she loves her sister that much that she was willing to go to this place that she, she knew was scary, but wasn't, you know, didn't realize how bad it was. And I, I just think that, you know, you want, I wanted to make Rosemary, important to the reader too. And so I wanted to show that connection between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Her imagination about the reality of the situation is so brilliant. I mean, I, 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 I don't even understand how a woman that living in this suburban area of upper New York can imagine the horror with the intimacy and the delicacy and the, and the you know, the compassionateness that Ellen, you know, proceeds. I mean, it's really, It's an extraordinary story from an extraordinary woman. Thank you. I appreciate that. Was there something that I didn't ask you about that you think is important to talk about um, or that I didn't give you a chance to say? Well, I I do want people to realize that this book is not just about, um, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook is not just about, you know, institutional abuse. It's also about a vulnerable but strong young woman who, who finds herself trapped in this, this nightmare. And in the end, she, she figures out a way to turn her heartbreak into something, into a force for good. Yeah. You know, so I think that's important. And I also hope that, you know, I try to blend these fact and fiction stories together because I want people to be still be entertained but also learn something at the same time. And the only way that you can get them to keep turning the pages is to, you know, have an entertaining story. So hopefully um, it worked. From my perspective, it was very successful, so. Thank you. I agree, I agree. And what, what Ellen brings up is the enormous torture and the struggle to just remain human I mean, I think that's part of what, what grabs people is that, that it sort of shows up the drama that we live in, the contradiction in our society today. This is an issue that is going to affect every single body in America sooner or later. I mean, 41 million people in the country have disabilities of one sort or another. Roughly the same amount of people are providing pro bono services for a dependent member of the family giving up an income as a result of the the barbarous medical delivery wealth transfer system that we experience. So we need a radical transformation of the medical service delivery system in America in order to decentralize, humanize, you know, and essentially provide a public health foundation for caring, which means that people in America have to care for each other. 
that call to care for one another from Dr. Bronston is a good place to close our conversation. I want you to know that he's also written a book, recently released, called Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional America. You can find it and its audiobook through Amazon, and I'll put a link to his website in the show notes. I'd like to thank Vida at Kensington Books for connecting me to Ellen and Dr. Bronston. Kensington generously provides Desideratum listeners the discount code DP20 to save 20% across their incredible library. You just enter DP20 at checkout at kensingtonbooks.com. Also, please check out Libro FM to find The Lost Girls of Willowbrook audiobook narrated by Morgan Hallett. Using the affiliate link to Libro FM supports this podcast and a local bookstore of your choice. You can find more about the heartbreak and hope in all of Ellen's fictions on her website. I'll put the links in the show notes and in our link tree found on our social media pages. As always, thank you for listening. Thanks for having us. It's a thank you very much. <laughs>